Welcome to Whores Talk Horror. We're not really whores. We just like wordplay. Hello and welcome to Whores Talk Horror. I'm Sharon. And I'm Melinda. Today's story is one most of you may have heard, yet I think of it as the biggest story never told. I say that for two reasons. One is that despite plenty of local news coverage and a feature in the New York Times, many Chicagoans don't even know about this story. And second, there's frustratingly little, or really, if any, leads or clues as to who's responsible for the murders of roughly 51 women that we know of over the past two decades. Shit's about to get real, everybody, because today we're going to talk about the Chicago Strangler. I just want to say that Mindy took on this story. She did all the research. So I'm hearing all this for the first time myself. So, um, yeah, I'm I've heard about the story. I don't know a lot of the details, but um, Mindy, I'm sure you're going to do a good job covering it. So be ready for Sharon's frustrated what and what the fuck and all that kind of stuff. Fair warning. (laughs) Um, Speaking of warnings, uh, I want to give a quick trigger warning just for the episode in general. Um, The intention of this episode is to focus our story on the the timelines, the facts, the family members, and of course the victims. Uh, But this story does contain details of violent death, disturbing violence towards women and sexual assault. So listener discretion advised. Uh, I'd also like to say apologies in advance to all involved with this story for any mispronunciations of names. Some name pronunciations we weren't really able to find online. uh, So we mean no disrespect. But we do apologize in advance. We're going to try our very, very best. So let's dive right in here. For the past 20 years or so, someone has been stalking and killing women, mostly on the south and west sides of Chicago. Certain details are more readily accessible than others. But here's the overall gist, courtesy of Billy Jensen over at the Murder Squad. And I will be playing the part of Billy Jensen. Since the beginning of 2001, the bodies of over 50 women have been discovered in vacant lots, abandoned buildings, alleys, and garbage cans. The victims vary in race, age, and occupation, but they were all strangled or asphyxiated. Law enforcement was not confirmed or even stated that they believe there is even one serial killer active in Chicago. However, The Murder Accountability Project became aware of several clusters. One of the founders of the Murder Accountability Project has alerted authorities. While they haven't agreed with the data, they are currently reviewing the cases. So that synopsis is from May of 2019. But as of this recording, August 2021, uh, the Chicago PD still have no suspects and worse, no real answers for the victims, families and loved ones. So I think it's best if we just jump right into the details chronologically and go from there. So let's do it. Okay, on January 4th of 2001, the body of Angela Mariana Ford, aged 32 at the time, was found in the basement of an abandoned building on the 200 block of 46th Street in Chicago. She had been strangled. This was a standalone case until March 28th of that same year, when, roughly nine miles away, the body of Charlotte Day was found in the back of a vacant lot, also a victim of strangulation. Then in August, two more bodies were found. On August 2nd, Winifred Shines was found strangled in the back lot of a shop and buy clothing store. Then on August 22nd, Brenda Cowart was found strangled in a vacant lot. By the end of 2001, two more women would fall victim. Elaine Bonita was found strangled face down on the sidewalk on November 5th. Then on December 28th, Sadia Banks was found strangled in her apartment. In 2002, six more women were murdered. Bessie Scott, Gwendolyn Williams, Jody Grissom, Lorraine Harris, Deli Jones, and Celeste Jackson. 
all were found in abandoned buildings, vacant lots, or in alleys, and all were victims of strangulation. Now, I want to pause for a sec to talk about Gwendolyn Williams, the second victim of 2002. Her family referred to her as a protector, loyal, with a big heart, and strong. A lover, not a fighter, unless she had to be. On Wednesday, June 12th, 2002, Gwendolyn's body was found behind a dollar store in the 4800 block of North Sheridan Road. She'd been strangled, was covered in blood, and half-dressed. Police officials reported that drugs and alcohol were found in her system, but Gwen fought her attacker, just like the strong protector her family said she was. While investigators found evidence of sexual assault and were able to get a semen sample, they also found a stranger's skin samples behind Gwen's nails. She was 44 years old. So these next details are a tad hazy, which you'll see why in a bit. Supposedly, the DNA collected from Gwendolyn's body, and it's not sure if it, it's not clear if whether it was the fingernails or the semen samples, but supposedly they did match a suspect who'd recently been arrested in Tampa on a first degree murder warrant. However... The suspect claimed not to know Gwendolyn and said he wasn't even in Chicago at the time of the murder. In the end, the Cook County's district attorney's office declined to extradite the suspect. No specific reason was given for the DA's decision, though it's been said the detectives working on Gwendolyn's case were pretty PO'd about it. One possible reason for the DA's decision not to extradite could be that the suspect was already in custody. Depending on the nature of the crime committed, the DA may have thought, well, he's in custody and he's not getting out. Let's not spend our resources getting him to Chicago, paying for travel, housing him, etc. Which leads me to one of the biggest blockers in this case, resources. Put a pin in resources because we're going to come back to that later. So I wasn't able to find specifics about the suspect who matched the DNA found on Gwendolyn Williams in her case, probably because he was never charged with her murder, so his name may never have been released. Uh, I do hope that he stood trial for something big and ended up behind bars. And in Florida, no less, because they don't fuck around. Because regardless, it's not the justice the Williams family wants, nor that Gwendolyn deserves. Moving on to 2003, that year saw eight more murders, all strangled and mostly found in alleys, vacant lots, but this time with a few deviations. In March of 2003, Nancy Walker was strangled and dismembered. Her remains were discovered by a cleaning crew picking up trash on the side of the road. Later that year, in October, Lucisette Thomas was found in the garage of an abandoned building, having been strangled, but also showed evidence of blunt force trauma to the head. Similarly, on December 26th, the body of Ethel Amerson was found on the second floor of an abandoned building. Amerson had also been strangled and suffered blunt force trauma to the head. And I guess... Experts on this subject say, you know, killers sometimes evolve, so possibly that's what's happening here. We don't know. Um, In 2004, three women were murdered, all strangled, all in the usual places, an alley, a garage, a garbage can behind a factory. 2005 saw a slight rise to five strangulations, and there were only three in 2006 with one variation. On July 14th, 2006, Antoinette Simmons' body was found in a city trash container. She had been asphyxiated and still had a plastic bag around her head. Um, Really quick, Mindy, I was going to say the the suspect that you mentioned in Florida. Yeah. If he was somehow related to the case of Gwendolyn, then maybe Gwendolyn is... Either there's two uh, instances. It could be that Gwendolyn was not one of the victims of the Chicago Strangler. She just happened to die in a similar fashion at the hands of this man that they, you know, tracked down in Florida. But if that guy 
went to prison for another murder down in Florida, then he wasn't the Chicago Strangler. True. True. Um, The issue, though, too, is that we are not quite sure what DNA was tested that matched him. Mm hmm. Um, that's that and that's you'll see that that's a recurring theme there's just too many unknowns unfortunately um I I, will put a pin in that too actually put a pin in that idea but I like the way you're thinking and I'm also interested to see if there was any other DNA that was found on any of the other women that they were able to tie any of these together to one person or multiple people or it, it seems like the killer is a little sloppy and it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, there's strangulation, there's blunt force trauma, dismemberment. There's so many different things. And it, it almost seems like it's um, more of like a crime of opportunity and maybe possibly like whatever's around that he has to use to murder these women. That it's not so like, you know, planned out like the way that um, other killers, you know, other serial killers were more meticulous and, you know, it had uh, a lot more patterns. This just seems more random. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, there are only to, at this point, only there, there are other deviations, which I'll get to, but there, there haven't been many deviations. And I think some of the murder accountability stuff um, might answer some of those questions, but I like the way you're thinking because I I do have an idea as to what the detectives who had worked on these cases think. And and so just keep that. Keep in mind what you just said, Sharon, as we keep going, because this is why we have a podcast together. Okay, I like how you're thinking. You're doing a good job so far. So keep it up. I know this is this is rough subject matter to get through. So. Oh, thank you. And actually, Sharon, speaking of deviations, 2007 saw something unusual. Of the four women that were murdered that year, two had very striking differences from the other two. The remains of both Teresa Bunn and Hazel Marion Lewis were found a day apart from each other on opposite ends of Washington Park, which is a Southside Park located in Chicago. Teresa Bunn was found on November 13th, Hazel Lewis on November 14th. Both women had been strangled They remain stuffed in garbage cans and the cans lit on fire. So for that one, I'm sorry, I I feel like there's no way that there wasn't like one person who did both of those murders. But to your point, could be possible that those murders were not part of the other groups. We're not really sure. Or the other possibility is that it was, but they left way too much DNA evidence. So decided to just burn the evidence completely. That's a very, very good point. Um, the killings continued as the years advanced, but the number of murders per year started to lull until the year of 2014 when they stopped completely. And there are thoughts about this, which, again, I'll get to. Unfortunately, in 2017, the strangulation started again. Diamond Turner's body was found in a garbage can on March 3rd. She was asphyxiated and had blunt force trauma. Now, remember Diamond. Remember her name. She may turn up again in this story. Then on June 22nd, Catherine Saderfield Buchanan was found strangled in a parkway. The four women murdered in 2018 are also seemingly considered the last in this pattern of strangulations. 2018 was also the year that everything changed. And it starts, appropriately enough for this show, with our final girl, as it were. Considered the final victim of the Chicago Strangler, Rayo Renee Holyfield, age 34, was found by a streets and sanitation employee on Monday, September 10th, 2018. Her body was badly decomposed and was found in a trash can in, get this, Sharon, an alley off 95th Street, not far from Trinity United Church of Christ. So kind of where 95th Street and the Dan Ryan meet up about that area. For Mm -hmm. any of you in Chicago who might know that, but for our reference, we do. (laughs) Not far from where we grew up. Right. Cause of death was possible strangulation and or asphyxiation. Uh, And yes, the police asked around, came up with nothing, 
But a few months after Holyfield was found, Pam Zekman, an investigative reporter with CBS News, decided to revisit the details of Holyfield's case, and she thought there might be a bigger picture and decided to report on it. So 2001, it took till 2018 before somebody was like, these women have been going missing. We should say something about this. Unbelievable. Rhea Holyfield was very, very close to her cousin, Ricardo Holyfield, who called Rayo, his big sister, and remembers her fondly. The following is from the Chicago Reader. Sharon, would you like to read this for us? Sure. As little kids, Rio was the one who made peanut butter and jelly on crackers for him at their grandmother's Inglewood house. In their teens, he used to tag along with Rio when she competed in rap battles. She was like Nicki Minaj way before Nicki Minaj, he raved. Later, she moved to the north side in a city in which North and South were still code for white and black. She would walk anywhere, go anywhere, he eulogized. She was never scared. Ricardo was actually contacted by Pam Zekman months after his cousin's death and was shocked not just to learn about the list of 51 women, but even more so that his cousin was on it. Now... Enter Thomas Hargrove, also a Chicago native, it turns out, but he is also the co-founder of the Murder Accountability Project, which we've mentioned previously. And that program is a nonprofit that tracks the country's unsolved homicides, then uses that data to investigate possible links between crimes via an algorithm. Hargrove is also the man responsible for the algorithm that specifically connected Holyfield to 50 other murdered women in the city. Quick backstory on Hargrove here. He began specializing in serial killers after the 2001 arrest of Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, who was linked to the murders in Washington state of more than 70 women and girls, most of them runaways or involved in sex work. Looking back at Ridgway's crimes, Hargrove felt certain that the similarities in their locations, methods, and victim profiles could have been pieced together sooner, like a puzzle, to reveal the handiwork of a single suspect. Lives could have been saved. So, he created an algorithm that crunches the nation's crime data and sorts unsolved murders by their shared characteristics. That's a great creation. Dude. Amazing. Thank you. Dude. Don't even... Just wait. Like, he's he's rad to listen to. <laughs> it's also kind of crazy that it took how long for something like that to be created? You would think that, you know, whoa, God, 20 years before that, something like that should have been created. <laughs> well, put a pin in that, too, actually. Okay. Put a pin in that, too. Um, so the Murder Accountability Project's algorithm picked out clusters of areas, again, the south, far south and west sides of Chicago, that seemed to have an unusual amount of unsolved strangulation murders with similar MOs. The vast majority of the victims were low income, some with a history of addiction and or prostitution, and the majority of the women were black. Tom Hargrove also found other patterns. Nearly all of the women were murdered outside or in abandoned buildings, though usually women are killed indoors by partners or family members. This may imply the killers and the victims were strangers to one another. Now, again, most of the killings occurred on the south and west sides of Chicago with a pronounced north to south pattern along South Indiana Avenue in Bronzeville. This might indicate a mobile killer with knowledge of the Chicago streets. In an interview with a and Hargrove noted, quote, There is one very odd pattern in the map. There is a very linear array of body recovery sites on the Chicago near south side, which forms an almost perfect north-south line, unquote. Now, for those of you not from Chicago, this is pretty much the same line that runs the way the Chicago Green Line elevated train runs, which while I highly doubt there's any killers out there transporting dead bodies on the L, 
I do agree that it does signal at least a familiarity with the area. Huh. And that maybe the killer is taking that train, uh, like right, getting right? off at each stop and finding a victim. And yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. We have pictures that we can, that I'll, we'll post on social and everything, but like I'm Sharon and Spencer, you guys know what, like the green line underneath that elevated track, it's just overgrown grass and weeds and junk. So, I mean, I don't want to advocate, but uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You don't want to hang out there. (laughs) It's not a place to hang out. It's not, yeah, it's not safe. Uh, Hargrove theorizes that it's possible the killer could live somewhere between the south and west sides in what our friend Paul Holes uh, from the Murder Squad calls a buffer zone or the smokestack effect, meaning typically killers don't kill in the area where they live. And I'm so tempted to make a don't shit where you eat comment here, but it just doesn't seem appropriate. Well, you just did. (laughs) So now... (laughs) I know, but I could have been I could have been worse, so I had to get that out of my system at least. So now in 2019, Thomas Hargrove presented his findings to the officials from the Chicago PD. This is from the Chicago Reader. They reviewed the full murder accountability project report, the charts, maps, and spreadsheets. But the officers remained unconvinced. They didn't see the same patterns as Hargrove. The predominantly black neighborhoods where the bodies were found spanned much of the south side and west side, a total area the size of Philadelphia. The killing stopped in 2014 and then picked up again three years later. To Hargrove, that suggested the killer was likely incarcerated and then released, but the police saw only the randomness of a violent city in which a lot of different people committed horrible crimes and few witnesses came forward to help catch the offenders. So to recap, Tom Hargrove walks into the office of the Chicago PD with data, charts, and reports galore that all show clear, recognizable, I think logical patterns and theories as to how this killer might be operating. Based on what I've read about Hargrove's data, which admittedly is very little compared to what authorities have, the data still clearly supports the theory that there's a pattern in these murders, I think. Yes, we have the benefit of hindsight here, but Hardgrove's work is impressive, and I think it tracks. Or, at the very least, it's worth looking into, or so I would think. So why wouldn't cops think so, too? I'll let Chicago's chief of detectives speak for himself. Here's what he had to say about Hargrove's impressive report, as reported in that same Chicago Reader article. Sharon, would you do the honors, please? Sure. quote we don't work that way with like the dots on the map and this says xyz so it must be this he goes on to say we can only work with what we know and what we can prove end quote dude that first sentence it's not very articulate man that's why you wanted me to read (laughs) (laughs) but like how what kind of a reaction is that i was floored when i read that i'm sorry we don't dots on a map. This says blah, 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 blah. blah, blah. I, oh, and I'm going to, I won't get started. So by now you're probably asking, what are the police working with then? And I want to be clear that this is not a cop bashing tirade. I think it's important to view all angles of a story, but I'm not bashing cops here. Now, going back to the whole, like, why didn't we have the murder accountability project years ago and all this kind of stuff? Keep in mind, a good portion of these murders occurred over a period of almost 20 years. And while 2001 and 2002, they weren't exactly the Stone Ages, in the field of DNA tech and analysis, it kind of was. That technology has been advanced light years since 2001. Okay, okay, you might say. But DNA analysis did exist back then, and the cops found some DNA. Why didn't they send as much DNA from the cases as possible? Ha! Fun fact here that I learned while researching. In the early 2000s, DNA processing took longer. Much longer. I'm talking anywhere from a few months, plural, to even years 
before you could get DNA results in some cases. Considering the Illinois State Crime Labs received evidence and DNA for testing from the entire state of Illinois, in addition to the city of Chicago, it's safe to say that the pipeline from the Chicago PD to the state crime labs was not just slow, but clogged. The, so Chicago police had to actually be picky about what they did and didn't send off for testing. Like take the FBI, for example. It's the FBI's policy to send literally everything from a crime scene to the labs for testing. Well, unfortunately, Chicago cops are not the FBI and didn't quite have those options in the early 2000s. Another reason is something that Hargrove calls pattern blindness. And I could totally see this. It happens to all of us. Sometimes when you're so close to something, like the detectives doing the boots on the ground investigative work, it's difficult to take a step back and see the bigger picture. Not to mention that communications between districts and sometimes even between detectives working in the same damn office was basically non-existent, which is bonkers to me, especially when you're, I don't know, tracking a serial killer or any f killer for that matter. Agreed. Yeah. Now, the police had taken and or kept some DNA samples from fewer than half of the 51 victims. But in 2020, an article published by the Medell Reports revealed that the 21 pieces of DNA tested all came back with 21 different male profiles, none of which was in the police database. Uh, the chief of detectives in Chicago, again, who oversaw the investigation, believed the findings to be nearly conclusive, saying, quote, they didn't find any links that linked all of these cases together or even five of them or any at this time. Well, that answers my earlier question. Right. But put a pin in that again. Just to clarify here, essentially the, quote, unofficial word, unquote, from the Chicago PD about this case seems to be a somewhat stubborn insistence that there is no evidence to suggest that there's an active serial killer in Chicago, or that any of these cases resemble each other. Interesting. That said, those within the department that are close or were close to these cases seem to unofficially theorize that while these killings do seem to be serial in nature, based on the recent DNA findings and Hargrove's data, most likely the perpetrator is not one, but probably two or three different killers. Bottom line, though, there are just too many similarities to think of all 51 of these women being killed in a similar fashion by 51 different people, I think. Yeah, I agree. There's definitely not 51 different killers um, involved in these women's cases, but I can see two or three. Um, yes, yes. But yeah, if, if you cannot find the DNA to link these cases together and who knows you know if the dna they collected it could have been from boyfriends or husbands or family members like who knows what the dna is that they actually recovered where that came from it could have been from someone completely irrelevant and not linked to the crimes at all so and to that point sharon remember diamond turner yes I said to remember her name. She was one of the two women murdered in 2017. Well, surprise twist. In January of 2020, police arrested a 52-year-old Chicago man named Arthur Hilliard for Diamond's murder. So detectives apparently suspected Hilliard from the start, and with good reason. Turner and Hilliard were reportedly living together and possibly, probably sexually involved. Her body was found behind Hilliard's building. And, oh yeah, a witness reported seeing Hilliard cleaning bloodstains that led from his bedroom to the back door. And the police learned that Hilliard soon got rid of his mattress after Diamond was killed. So much evidence pointed to him that it's hard to fathom how he was allowed to walk the streets for like three years. It's ridiculous. But... That's how damn long it took to process a specimen of DNA in 2017, three fucking years. The DNA in question was extracted not from Turner's body, but from the crime scene. 
and the match led finally to the arrest. So as of now, he is accused, but I was looking for more specifics and it looks like he has since been incarcerated and um, convicted as the murderer of Diamond Turner and her case is officially closed. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. So aside from Turner's killer, Hilliard, his recent arrest, or somewhat recent, (laughs) now that's 2021, seemingly the Chicago Strangler-esque murders or news of them, they died down in 2018, and then there's been nothing really since 2020. Which means that the person or persons are either dead or incarcerated, because it's hopefully moved on to another city and state who knows yeah i have a i have a thought on that that i was gonna that i'll get to in a little bit too but like yeah i i i have feelings about that because these women deserve justice but well hold that thought hold that thought so at this time i want to briefly mention an amazing resource that i came across while researching this episode as well as give a shout out to a local nonprofit here in chicago So the Unforgotten 51's website is, in my opinion, utterly incredible and one hell of a time suck. And it's absolutely worth your time. (laughs) Uh, Find out for yourselves by going to unforgotten51.com. Apologies, I don't remember which resource I got this blurb from, but here's how the Unforgotten 51 came to be. Over the spring and fall semesters of 2020, journalism students at Roosevelt University enrolled in the Capstone Journalism course undertook a working investigative reporting project examining the mostly unsolved strangulation murders of at least 51 Chicago women over the two decades. Led by Professor John W. Fountain, a former New York Times national correspondent and once the Chicago Tribune's chief crime reporter, uh, seeks to humanize the victims whose bodies were discarded, in many cases, in alleys on the west and south sides like yesterday's trash. The project includes narrative storytelling and multimedia stories culminating in a final published project that appears on their website, theforgotten51.com. So they've got articles, resources, links galore, including my favorite part of the site, personal stories about the victims from friends and family, which they call portraits of life. The following passage really, really resonated with me. Uh, When I read it, the sense of utter and total loss and shock was just devastating. And as someone who's not lost a loved one to this kind of tragedy, it's unthinkable to me how the survivors even carry on or even like get up in the morning. Seriously. Um, This next passage is about Sharon Williams, sister of Gwendolyn Williams, the fighter. Given the name, I'll ask our Sharon, if you would be so kind to read this for us. Yes. Uh, I'm going to try not to cry while (laughs) reading this. Sharon is still haunted by the call that morning from police with news about Gwen. The night before Gwen had been at her house caring for her as she was mending from surgery. The two sisters had sat in bed watching movies, laughing, Gwen planting kisses on her sister's dogs. Princess Adelmation still had Gwen's red lipstick. Oh, all right. Sorry, I'm starting to tear up. I know, I'm oh. sorry. I love this passage. That's why you made me read this. Uh, Princess Adelmation still had Gwen's red lipstick on her black and white spotted face when the phone rang with news of the murder. It's the last part. The red lipstick on the dog. It punched me in the gut, man. Like, ugh. And that's just like one part of one story. And I will say that the site is full of stories of little moments like this. Some are sad, but honestly, many are fun or even glorious because they are just celebrating who these women were. But thank you for reading that, Sharon. I know. I I just couldn't imagine like being on the phone and then looking at my pet and oh, God. So, and then you guys remember Ricardo Holyfield, right? Cousin to Rayo Holyfield, the final victim? Yes. 
uh, Ricardo worked as a security guard for the Chicago public school system. But after his cousin's death, he said he felt a responsibility to make the city safer and more humane. So in 2013, he started his own community organization called God's Gorillas, which aims to build peaceful, safe communities throughout Chicago. They've done things like hosted youth basketball tournaments on the South Side, thrown parties they call peaceful turnups, and Ricardo himself teaches boys how to box. God's Gorilla's message posted on their homepage is, quote, gloves up, guns down, unquote. One year, Ricardo even took a group of teens to feed the, feed the homeless who slept in encampments beneath Wacker Drive. Amazing. The URL for their site is godsgorillas.com, and the following mission statement is taken directly from their homepage. God's Gorillas' mission is to ensure safety everywhere, promote peace, and uphold our rights of enjoying life's fundamentals as citizens of this amazing city, Chicago, Illinois, unquote. There is a donation button and contact info if anyone in Chicago would like to get involved, And everyone not in Chicago, like I said, there's a donation button. (laughs) Uh, From what I've read, Ricardo seems like a great guy. So kudos to him for creating something positive out of a tragedy like this. Uh, Check out God's Gorillas, like I said, especially if you're in Chicago. And of course, as always, all of these links, including God's Gorillas link, will be in our show notes. Now, one of the main reasons we wanted to do this episode was that for too long, no one was talking about these women. But since 2018, that's changed. This is certainly not the first, nor will it be the last podcast to talk about these 51 women. And clearly, the more noise people make, the better the chances stories like this have of getting media and hopefully law enforcement's attention. To that point... In 2019, a task force was assembled to review all remaining evidence, and the FBI has offered the Chicago Police Department a grant to allow for expedited DNA testing. As of my writing this, it's still not clear whether the Chicago PD will take the FBI up on this offer, especially now that we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, But the challenge is, again... Some of these cases are almost 20 years old. Authorities have said that half the battle right now is simply finding old case notes, whatever evidence might have been collected and kept, etc. But it's not enough, surely, and the process will be tedious at best, but it is something. So my point is keep talking about it, keep getting it out there, because when somebody did, people took notice, and that's kind of awesome. Now, back to the 21 pieces of DNA that was that were tested, it's actually not clear exactly where the 21 pieces came from, um, as in like where on the bodies of the victims they were sampled from. It's entirely possible that the DNA could have come from another source altogether, like, you know, a couch cushion that somehow had the DNA of like one of the victim's kids on it or something I don't know we get DNA all over each other all the time that sounds really dirty but you know what I mean but again we don't know exactly so that's why that whole thing about the 21 pieces of DNA like it's interesting and it's worthwhile knowing but it's still again we don't know enough Um, what we do know is that as of 2020 there's been no news of more strangulations fitting Hargrove's pattern a big part of me wonders and worries what if the killer or killers succumb to covid over the pandemic or worse that the perps will never be found even if they didn't get covid and we and the victims families are never going to have an answer the thought is overwhelmingly heartbreaking i hate to say this but maybe covid would be more appropriate A strangler who dies because he slash they can't breathe after taking the lives of 51 women by cutting off their air supply. I I normally never wish ill will towards anyone, but this case might be one exception. These crimes need to be accounted for. And if nothing else, really, karma can be a bitch. But sadly, I really am worried that we may never know for sure how this story ends. And that is incredibly frustrating. 
I think you're right. The only yeah, the only thing we can do is is talk about the case as much as possible. Hope that uh, s- some people who have um, authority step in and re-examine the evidence, re-examine the the notes that were taken, um, and are able to put something together and get some suspects and see what happens from there. But yeah, it's, it's really heartbreaking that, um, (laughs) that just not more was done over the 20 years to, to help catch the killer or killers of all these women. Um, and as we've talked about before and as other shows have talked about before, um, it's most likely due to the fact that these women were women of color and possibly sex workers. So it wasn't right. prioritized. Right, right. And then that's why the CBS reporter, when she happened to catch wind of, you know, just one of the deaths and then was like, wait a minute. This is for 20 years. There's a somewhat of a pattern that may or may not be linked. And why has this not been on the news? Like, that's just, oh, my God, it's just frustrating. But yeah, so hopefully, again, just to keep keep talking about it. But um, I really like that website that um, humanizes them and tells their personal stories and their families, you know, family stories about them and. I, I think that that's really, really important to show that these people were just like every, all of us. They were humans. They had lives. They had families and friends. and you People know, that love them. Yeah, people that love them and miss them. Um, and yeah, that's really, really impactful and important to, to hopefully get some closure on all this. Um, and then, yeah, like Sharon, you mentioned... Um, it sounds like a lot of these people were, were or possibly were sex workers of some kind. And, you know, back to the whole DNA thing, like like you said, Mindy, the DNA could have come from somewhere that somehow got on them. Or if they were sex workers, yeah, that complicates this greatly. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's that's another reason where you get you get a different uh, DNA match for every single one of those people. And mm-hmm. yes, yeah, it's, it's really, really complicated and hard to figure this out. So especially with like so many missing puzzle pieces at this point, just because of the dates too. you know, like cops don't keep certain files or if they do, they fade or get lost or evidence gets lost or whatever. And over 20 years, God only knows, you know, like what's left. So that's annoying and I get Chicago's kind of a violent uh, city but it's just it's just unreal to me this story um, and I, I'm gonna keep my eye out obviously for any updates and uh, I'll be sure to let everybody know if something else comes up yeah and I'm definitely gonna go check out unforgotten51.com because I I want to read about these women's lives and there's great I pictures. Know who they are? Like they have all sorts of cool pictures. And honestly, like obviously, fifty-one women, like you're not necessarily going to get responses from everybody. Like when they were, the the Roosevelt University students were working on the project, you know, you they would reach out to families, and you know, some may have already passed on or whatever. But my point is that when I was doing this research, never once did I find any sort of comment from any of the victim's family or friends that were like, well, she was a prostitute and she was on drugs and it serves her right. Like they were all like, she may have had a problem in the past. She was working to get past it. She liked to sing. She liked to, you know, it was all these like lovely, wonderful things. So it's not like these are people that just went missing and nobody gave a shit. You know, like yeah. these people still have families that miss them. And it's and even, even if they didn't have families, you, right, it's no, still right. important to find out what happened because they're people. Exactly. And they, they deserve nothing less. So, OK, to close this episode out, we'd like to honor all the victims by reading all 51 names uh, as it's repeated, actually, on Unforgotten51.com. Uh Say that, say their names, say them with us if you know them, or hit pause and Google a list. We'll wait. But say their names because it matters. Ready, Sharon? This is gonna make me cry. I'm already tearing up. Yeah, I'm ready. Take a breath. Okay, I'll start. 
Angela Mariana Ford. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. Give me a minute. It, we're not live. <laughs> oh, Charlotte. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Charlotte W. Day. Winifred Shines. Brenda Cowart. Elaine Bonita. Sadia Banks. Bessie Scott. This is going to take forever because I do keep Do you want crying. me to do all of No, I don't want to do all of no, no, You should no, do no, it. No, 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 no. Okay. No, it's hard. It's okay. If I, if I have to re-say some, I can re-record with Spencer. All right. I'm going to get through this. All right. All right. Gwendolyn Williams. Jody Grissom. Lorraine Harris. Deli Jones. Celeste Jackson. Nancy Walker. Linda Green. Tarika Jones. Rosenda Baraccio. Latanya Keeler. Latricia Hall. Lucisette Mary Thomas. Ethel Emerson. Michelle Davenport. Tamala Edwards. Makalava Williams. Precious Smith. Denise Torres. Wanda Hall. Yvette Mason. Shaniqua Williams. Margaret Gomez. Antoinette Simons. Kelly Sarf. Veronica Frazier. Mary Sakowski. Teresa Bunn. Hazel Marian Lewis. Genevieve Jenny Mellis. Charlene Miller. Latoya Banks. Shannon Williams. Vanessa Rojovovich. LaFonda Sue Wilson. Quanda L. Kreider. Angela Prophet. Pamela Wilson. Velma Howard. Diamond Turner. Catherine Saderfield Buchanan. Valerie Marie Jackson. Laura Dawn Harbin. Nicole Linnell Ridge. And Rayo Renee Holyfield. <sighs> All right, well. <laughs> Sorry, this was. I'm like, it literally, I have tears. No, no. Streaming down my face. Um, I was like, take a breath. <sighs> Sorry, this was not a more upbeat episode, but we felt we shouldn't have uh, taken <laughs> our new, you know, our usual lightheartedness and healthy dose of humor that we have with most of our episodes. It shouldn't really be used in this episode. So our outro isn't really going to be the same. Um, and we promise that next week we will be back to our silly selves. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much for listening. If you know anything, if you have any uh, details, any um, evidence, any anything that you know about the deaths of these 51 women, you can contact the Murder Accountability Project or the Chicago PD. They do have an anonymous tip line that you can contact if you have any information that you can give to help catch the murderer or murderers of these 51 women. Uh, and as Mindy said earlier, we will include links in the show notes to everything, you know, all the uh, wonderful organizations that Mindy talked about. And um, yeah, please go, go visit them, go read about these women uh, and spread their names and do what you can do to help get this story more, attention. And Mindy, thank you so much. Uh, you did a wonderful job presenting the evidence and not, you know, getting too much into the the horrendousness of these crimes and focusing much more on the women. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. So thank you for doing this research, because once again, this is not an easy subject matter to cover. I was about to respond and say, oh, my God, my pleasure. And that sounds so weird. But <laughs> like, I want, you know, I wanted to do it. But yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. You're welcome. I'm going to just say that. <laughs> and, and Mindy, if um, anyone wants to reach out to us personally, uh, mm. where can they find us? Uh, you can send us an email at whorestalkhorror at gmail.com. Um, or you can send us a message or post on our social channels. We're on Instagram, Twitter, 
and Facebook, or just check out our Patreon page. And maybe if you have a few extra bucks, feel free to subscribe to our Patreon page. Um, But mostly, be safe out there and remember that we all need to look out for one another in this crazy ass world, especially right now. Um, We love you, all of you guys listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And as always, thanks for getting creepy with us. Sharon, you want a beer? Uh, Oh my God.